Please take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Revelation, chapter 7. Is situated in between chapter six and eight. <laughs> Rudy looked at me and said, "That's sharp." <laughs> <laughs> chapter seven is actually an interlude in between uh, the sixth and seventh sealed judgments, and uh, the, the sealed judgments are coming on the earth because of the great tribulation. They're being poured out upon the earth. And it is a, the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a time like uh, you and I have never seen. And right in between chapter 6 and 8 is 7 that uh, shows in a time of, even in the tribulation, a time of the great mercies of God that's available. And uh, he says in verse 1, and after these things, he is seeing the things of the seven sealed judgments. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were still 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day that you've given to us, the opportunity to be in the house of God. Thank you for the good songs we've been sung to glorify Jesus. Thank you for the testimony that gives praise and honor to God. And thank you for the word of God that we have just read. I ask you, sweet Holy Spirit of God, to take that word and make it real in our hearts, applicable in our lives. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, fill me with your spirit, and please help us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. You notice in verse 10 of this portion of Scripture, the Bible says, And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. You notice in verse 12 of the elders that, uh, and the, uh, the, the angels and the elders, the four beasts, fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Verse 12 saying, Amen, and so be it, or truth, as we would say today, when something uh, hits home, we would say amen. That means truth, so be it. 
And then when they say, saying amen, there's a sevenfold praise that they give unto God. Seven is the number of completion. And you'll look at this, it says blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. <clears throat> amen. There's a sevenfold praise that they give a shout out unto the Lord. In the middle of that verse is our word thanksgiving. And so in verse 10, it's speaking of the word salvation that has been mentioned. And then in verse 12, in the middle of it is the word that we are utilizing, thanksgiving. And so tonight we're speaking about thank, thankful for God's salvation. Thanksgiving, or thankful for God's salvation. And uh, I want you to notice this as the, uh, the lesson message tonight would uh, build upon uh, your salvation, God's salvation. And uh, you, you consider your own salvation and giving God the thanks for it. But you think about how you came to the uh, point of salvation in your life. It is a, um, it's a miracle of God for somebody to, to get saved. And it is nothing to take lightly. And uh, praise God for it. Now, notice this. And we're thanking God for our salvation. You notice in the book of Acts chapter 17... Acts chapter 17, we know that uh, God is omnipotent, we know God is omniscient, we know God is omnipresent, we know God makes no mistakes, we know God cannot make a mistake, we know that God is good, and we know that salvation is of God. Within the omnipotence or all-powerful God that we serve, He gives man the freedom of choice. And... Uh, we praise God for that, that God doesn't save anyone against their will. It is in accordance with their will. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But God doesn't make you get saved. And uh, God doesn't send some to hell, some to heaven uh, based on his choice. But uh, he allows you to make up your own mind and gives you free will. Thank God if you're saved, you chose God. <laughs> Praise God for that. Yeah, there are things uh, in your life that you didn't choose. I mean, uh, you didn't choose to, to be uh, born, but uh, that was a decision that uh, God uh, made whenever that you were born. And it was through the natural process with a, with a husband, with a wife, that you were uh, conceived and that you were, you were born. Now, praise God for that. Praise God that you were born. And um, in Acts chapter 17, uh, you, you didn't choose that you would be born uh, as an American because uh, you, you weren't around to make those choices. But in Acts chapter 17, I like this portion of Scripture where in verse 24, the Bible says, God that made the world and all things therein, Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And so he gives life, he gives breath, and he gives all things. So he is the beginning of life, he was the beginning of your life. He is the sustaining of your life, in other words, your breath. And it is in God's hands. Don't take that for granted. And all things are sustaining of things that you need for life. Verse 26. And have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he's speaking about that. Uh, you know, we all came from Adam and Eve. And then we came from him, Shem, and Japheth. And we all have. That same kind of blood, whether or not you know the different races and so forth, you still you have uh, you have blood, and it is the blood that uh, gives life. Now watch this: nations of men for to dwell on all the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, 
have determined that. God, God determined that. God determined, allowed you to be born. Praise God for that. God determined that you would be born as uh, an American or that you are in this country, and we praise God for that. And so, number one, I thank God for this country. I thank God for our country. I thank God for America. I thank God that he allowed me to be born. And I thank God that he allowed me to be born in America. And he says here that, uh, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He determined the time that you would uh, be born. You're, you're born and you're in this time frame. And so this is the best time for you to live because it's when God allowed you to be born and allowed to live. This is the best time every day. This is the day that the uh, Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it every day. Praise God for that. Don't wish that you were born some other time. This is the time frame that God has had you here on earth, and you praise God for that. Amen. And he's given you uh, this uh, birth, and he's allowed you to be here in America. Don't wish that away, and uh, praise God for that, that he's done that. He appointed that. He's appointed your times and the bound of their habitation. And so he determined that you would be here. Now watch this. Verse 27, this is the why that they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So he's allowed you to be born. He didn't determine whether you would be saved or lost, but he allowed you to be born. He determined whether you would be a boy or a girl. And uh, he, he determined at conception everything about you. You know, as far as uh, height or stature or eyes or color of eyes and color of, of hair and th those types of things. He determined that. You're an individual. Praise God for that. He determined that. And he determined when you was going to be born. He determined that you were going to be born here in, these, in America. And he did that so that you could seek after the Lord. If... He doesn't make you. He wants you to. He desires that. If, verse 27, happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now, I'm not saying that be, you know, being born in America is any guarantee that you would, but you can. And I'm not saying that others in another country have the, the less opportunities, though there's a lot of opportunity here in America. As testimony was given that you have the Word of God, you have copies of the Word of God that a lot of other people do not have, never have had. And uh, they, they still have the same God, they still have the, the same testimony of creation and uh, the, the light that lighteth every man if they will respond. But you have a lot of opportunity here in America and I praise God for that. And the, the verse says, For in him or in Christ we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. So we thank God for America. And we do thank God for those that defend this great nation and defend our freedom. We praise God for that. We praise God for those that are in the leadership that stand up for the Constitution and they have to stand against the odds because they would do away with the Constitution if they could, if they would give in. And we praise God for those that stand up for a voice and uh, for the Constitution. I thank God for the, the rights that He gives us. We, we say the unalienable rights and we, and we praise God for those freedoms. We praise God for that, that he would allow us to continue uh, assembling, that we would be able to continue having a Bible, that we would be able to continue uh, meeting in prayer without having to, to hide out. But I, I want to exercise my rights in that so that God would look down and, and say, because they are, I'm going to defend those rights so that we don't give that right. 
I thank God that he's established uh, America on religious liberty. And it was not without blood. It was not without uh, lots of battles. But uh, I praise God for that. And I, I praise God for our country. I, I thank God that he allowed me to be born. And I thank God that he allowed me to be born in America. And I echo some of the testimony that, yeah, it, there's been a lot of difficult things. There's a lot of, been a lot of difficult things in my life. And most of those I've run on myself. But there's been a lot of difficulty. But I praise God that he allowed me to be born and allowed me to be born in America. Here's number two. I not only thank God for our country, and uh, I, I believe that uh, that's part and parcel of why that you, if you're a saved, born again child of God, that God orchestrated that so that you would seek Him, seek the Lord. But I thank God for the church, and I thank God for our church. And uh, the Bible says of the church that it is the pillar and ground of truth. And we praise God for that. You're in the book of Acts. If you are, turn to, to chapter 20. And we praise God for the church because Jesus, he purchased the church. And he did that with his blood. In Acts chapter 20 and in verse 28, the Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. And to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. To feed the church of God means that we would meet and feast on the word of God. And that's what he's talking about. And that is because of the Lord Jesus has purchased the church and he purchased it with his own blood. The Lord Jesus Christ loves the church. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, uh, the Lord makes that clear that God loves his church. And so you and I ought to love the church. We ought to uh, want to serve in the church. He says in Ephesians and in chapter 5 and in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so as a husband and wife, uh, Mary, they are an open testimony to the world of a picture of Christ in his church. And that's why uh, the, the devil is against marriage and the devil is against a uh, husband and a wife in the house because it is a picture of Christ in his church. And the devil hates Christ, the devil hates the church, but uh, I, I love the church and I thank God for our church. Jesus gets the glory to himself in the church. In Ephesians in chapter 3 and in verse 21, the Bible says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And so everything that is done in the church ought to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise God for the church. Jesus will protect his church. Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus will protect his church. And so you and I ought to be involved in the church, and we ought to be inviting people to his church to be able to hear the word of God. We ought to be inviting the little children to come into the church. I know of at least two of you, and your testimony is that uh, the Lord Jesus used an outreach ministry as the bus ministry uh, to get you into the house of God, to get you to salvation, and we praise God for that. And uh, we still have freedom of assembly. We praise the Lord for that. We thank God for that. And we ought to not take that for granted, and we ought to be involved in it. We still have the freedom of speech, means that uh, we can preach and teach the Word of God. We still have the freedom to be able to gather and to pray. And so we ought to do that. We have the freedom to be able to read the Bible. And we thank God for our church. We thank God for Christians. I thank God for Christians. If you notice this in, in Philippians in chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 1. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 3. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul says to the church of Philippi, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Thank God for Christians. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. 
And so he is speaking to the children of God there in the church of Philippi. And so when we're thinking about this holistically about our salvation and thankful to God for salvation, we went to the end of the book in the book of Revelation and it was around uh, God's throne. And so there on, there on earth, there was the great tribulation and it was in between the sixth and the seventh sealed judgment. And uh, in, in the sixth uh, sealed judgment in between and the seventh sealed judgment, there was an interlude or a pause. And so uh, down on the earth, there's a coming a time of, of Jacob's trouble, a time like nobody has ever seen. And there's been snapshots of that throughout history to, to see what that's going to be like. In the book of Daniel, we looked at uh, uh, the Antiochus Epiphanes and a time in between the Testaments where uh, there was uh, an individual that was like the devil or like the Antichrist. And his goal was to wipe out Jerusalem, wipe out Judaism, and to wipe out the Jews. And he, he, he fared well at that, wreaking havoc. And even at that time, he went into the temple and he offered a sow, uh, a, a hog, there on the altar to pollute and to just kind of snub his nose at Judaism and the Jews and, and God. But there arose a group of people that said, we're not going to have that. We're going to cleanse this. We're going to, to run that out of here. And it was uh, the Maccabees. And there was an individual, Judas Maccabees, that stood up for God and stood up for the faith and the word of God and said, we're not going to have that anymore. And so they cleansed the temple because of God. There was a time when the devil used a man named Adolf Hitler slaughtered and burned and killed over six million Jews trying to annihilate the Jews. Those are picture types. But God says of the Great Tribulation, there's been a there's going to be a time where no one's ever seen anything like it. And uh, the, the church will be raptured out, praise God for that. And we'll be in heaven. And then the judgments are coming on the earth. And judgment after judgment after judgment is coming on earth. And in between the sixth and seventh seal of judgment, God seals 144,000 witnesses, Jews, out of the tribes that are not lost. God knows where they are. And it is for the preaching of the gospel. And it is after that where it says that there's a number, in, innumerable amount of people around the throne, throne room of God. And oh, they're glorifying God. They give out a, a seven part praise unto God. Praising God. Praising God. It came out of great tribulation. And they're wearing white robes that was washed in the blood of the Lamb. I mean, they were as close to hell as you could get. They seen hell on earth. And they wouldn't take the mark of the beast. And they got saved. And then they got martyred. And they're praising God for it. I thank God for our country of our birth and where he allowed you to be born. Thank God that you were born. You get to go to heaven if you're saved. Thank God for the church that's still sending out the gospel and preaching and teaching the word of God and maybe sending out a van or sending out a bus or knocking on doors. And I understand that uh, people won't answer some of the doors, but every now and then somebody answers the door and answers the call and they get saved. Thank God that somebody gave you a track and that's the work of the church. Thank God for that. Thank God for Christians. And in Philippians 1, 3, the Bible says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. This is the church of Philippi. This is where the Apostle Paul was sent out of the church as a missionary. And uh, he, he was beaten, he was battered, he was bruised, but he wouldn't give up. And uh, everywhere that he went, there was somebody either getting saved or somebody trying to kill him and stone him. 
and this this church of Philippi was birthed out of a very difficult time. He was beaten him and Paul and Paul and Silas thrown into the inner jail. And at midnight they sang praises unto God. And the Philippian jailer came in and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And years later, he could think about that. He thought about Lydia down by the, the river where prayer was wont to give up, where they met with a lady's prayer meeting, but she wasn't saved. And he, he thought about that demon-possessed damsel that followed with a false gospel. He thought about the Philippian jailer. He, you know, he, he, he didn't think much more about the scars that were on his back. He thought about the Philippian jailer getting saved and then getting baptized and his house hearing and they get saved. And uh, what a great memory of that. I thank God for Christians. And he says, I, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you through all the difficulties and, and all, all those things. But I thank God for Christians. They're identified with their leader, Christ. It's Acts 11, 26, where they were first called Christians at Antioch. I thank God that they are able to endure persecution, some more than others, but it will come. I thank God that they stand up for God and stand up for good, and they would give testimony here in a public setting in the church, and they would give testimony out to a lost and dying world. I thank God for Christians that keep telling other people about how to become a Christian. I thank God that there was a preacher that preached the gospel when I got saved. I praise God for a mother that prayed and prayed and prayed for me. I thank God for the Christian uh, men and, and women when I was a, a young boy that taught. And I thank God for the Christian men who taught after I got to be an adult. So that I can learn the Bible. I thank God for Christians. Christians are still used to spread the gospel. Christians are still used to preach. Christians are still used to teach others. And to tell the world the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for Christians. They're called to repentance to spread the gospel. I thank God that uh, Christians are used and they, they are restored. And when they get into backsliding, that all they have to do is confess their sins. And He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And to dust us off and put us back in and praise God for that. But it consummates that in our salvation, I thank God for Christ. When they're standing around the throne room of God they're giving praise to Christ to the Lamb that was slain for the foundation of the world you notice this in Luke chapter 9 and I'm talking about you and I being thankful by the grace of God for our salvation and you gave testimony or you thought about it how you got saved what led you to be saved. You weren't always saved. There was a time when you weren't saved. And if you got saved, there was a time when you got saved. And I praise God for it because geographically He's placed you where you can hear the gospel. I praise God that He birthed you so that you could get saved and kept you alive till you could get saved. You, you think about it that if you died after you reached the age of accountability and you didn't get saved, that you died without Christ, you go to hell. Thank God that He kept you alive after you reached the age of accountability so that you can get saved. And I thank God for the church that uh, used the gospel and believed in still going out soul winning or telling somebody about Jesus. I thank God for the Christian that may have spoken to you about the gospel, gave you a tract, gave you the word of God that was instrumental in getting you to Jesus. But I thank God for the Christ. I thank God for Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, the Bible says of the Lord Jesus, in verse 51, Luke 9, verse 51, And it came to pass, when the time was come, that... He should be received up. 
This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That uh, he was birthed. He was conceived of the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit of God. And he lived some 33, 33 and a half years of sinless perfection. He did no miracles as a young uh, boy to get noticed. He was obedient to his upbringing, his, his mom and his dad. And the Bible says at the wedding of Cana, when he turned the water into wine, which is a picture of salvation, that this beginning of miracles Jesus did of the turning of the water into wine. That's when he began his earthly ministry. And the first earthly uh, miracle that he did, heaven sent, was turning the water uh, into wine or a picture of salvation. And the Bible says that uh, he knew from the foundation of the world because he was God, that he was the lamb slain, but he also was 100% man, that uh, there in the garden that he sweat as if it were great drops of blood and said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And Hebrews gives you a more intense picture of that, of him and God alone in the garden. And you say, but he was God. Yeah, but he was 100% man as well. And he was, he, he knew that he was going to die on the cross. And the Bible says that when it came to that time, verse 51, now watch this. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Steadfastly. Thank God for Christ that he didn't back up. Thank God for Christ that he didn't back out. He was tempted of the devil to do that. We thank God that he didn't do that. We thank God for Christ. In Colossians and in chapter 1, if you notice this. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. This is a prison epistle. And the Bible says in verse 12, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And this is speaking about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in the salvation of the soul. And we thank God for Christ. He has delivered us or saved us. When, a, when the Bible speaks here of darkness, He has saved us from the dominion of sin. Sin is very powerful. Sin is likened unto darkness. And the Bible says that uh, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And the Lord Jesus Christ has delivered us or saved us from that dominion. The dominion of sin. Sin is of the devil and sin appeals to the flesh. And he not only saved us from the dominion of sin, but he saved us from the domination of Satan. He's the prince of darkness. And uh, he's the prince of the power of the air. And that, that's the devil and his dominion over you. The, the, the devil doesn't want you to get saved. And when you get saved, the devil doesn't want you to serve God. He not only saved us from the dominion of sin and the domination of Satan, but the doom of an eternal hell, which is called outer darkness. Matthew 25, 30, the Bible says that uh, these will be cast into outer darkness. And so you, you put it together, there is darkness that men are attracted to because their deeds are evil. They're under dominion of the prince of darkness, the devil. And if they don't get saved, they're cast out into outer darkness forever and ever and ever. The Bible says in this one, in this passage of Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, that we thank God for Christ because He's delivered us out of that. Your flesh didn't want delivered out of that. 
The Holy Spirit of God wanted you delivered. He spoke the word of God. You received that. You believed that. You accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And you were delivered from the devil over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the Bible says he has translated us into the kingdom of his son. There's the kingdom of the devil of which all are part. And uh, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were translated into the kingdom of His Son. The kingdom of His Son is light, which is the opposite of darkness. The Bible says that uh, He has translated us into that kingdom. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 8, Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, that's before that you got saved. It's the natural thing that the man is part of or the woman is part of this darkness. And the flesh likes that. And so he says, but now are you light in the Lord? And so there is this translation from darkness over to light. And the kingdom of the devil to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus and so he says, walk then as children of light, the kingdom of light. In 1 Peter and in chapter 2, the Bible says that this light is the marvelous light. In 1 Peter and in chapter 2, when he translated you into the kingdom of his son, it was because that uh, he translated you into his light. He is light. Now you are a child of light. In uh, 1 Peter in chapter 2, uh, in verse 9, the Bible says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Marvelous light. In Colossians 1.12, we were already there, but it says that we have been prepared as children of light. And so there is this uh, deliverance from darkness into light. And he's made us meet or proper to be partakers of that inheritance. How is it? These three thoughts as we close. We thank God for Christ because he's made you meet or proper to be partakers of his inheritance <coughs> by redemption. That is the very purchase of God. The price. What, are, what is the worth of a soul? According to God, it's worth more than all the world. All the world. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? All He would give all. What, what is the worth of a, of a little child coming in on the van and, and getting saved? To Jesus, it's worth all the world. And one day it will be worth all the world to you standing before the throne room of God. It's by redemption, the purchase of God. It's through His blood. That's the price of God. And it's the forgiveness of sin. That's the purpose of God. We thank God for that. Thank God for His salvation. And it's the reason that we can uh, tomorrow sit down at a meal and thank God for our salvation. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the word of God that we have read, the truths that are contained therein. And dear Lord, if we can just ponder some of the truths. We thank God for our salvation. Thank you, dear God, for the country that you allowed us to be born in. We thank you, dear God, for the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth that upholds truth. We thank you, God, for the Christians that are used to give us the gospel. But we thank God for Christ, for our soul salvation, the price that was paid. Help us, dear God, to ponder these thoughts and to be able to give you thanksgiving for that. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen.